Hello, hello. Um, I'm back. I'm Mary Whip. I'm your virtual visiting artist here with Sanford Arts and um, we're all ready for another session. Um, this time I'm going to kind of follow up with some marbling that I did in an earlier session and I'm going to take those previously marbled sheets and over marble them. Some of us like to call it overdoing it. Um, and then um, and then I'm going to use that paper for something different. So normally we think of these Sumi Nagashi papers as a, a decorative paper, but in this case it's merely a, a substrate for a drawing. So the sheets that the sheets that I did earlier are rather kind of muted and plain, and then I'm going to even um, exaggerate that more by doing another layer of muted and plain colors over the top of these um, and then um, use that to draw on, like I said. So um, maybe first we'll go out and uh, take a look in the woods. There's some kind of special stuff out there that, um, that we'll use later for our drawing. So, um, and then I might just point out the drawing that you see here is the finished product of this process. So you can see that, that the picture of the plants and leaves becomes um, the focus of this finished work and the marbling that's in here is deep behind the drawing. So it's, it's just kind of the beginning point for a drawing. So let's get, um, well, we'll get outside and take a look at, at a couple things and then, then I'll set up the tank here and we'll, we'll start to over marble or as some say, overdo it. So I also want to um, explore with you some of the things that, that I find is inspiration um, for all sorts of artwork. Um, I'm especially inspired by the forest and so part of what I want to do is take you on a little adventure into the forest here in the Black Hills um, of Western South Dakota to explore just what it is about nature that can be so inspiring.
Well, so here we are. It's a, a spruce forest with a beautiful tapestry of plants underneath in the understory on the floor of the forest. And we want to kind of take a, a closer look at a few of these things. Um, got the trees overhead, creating a really wonderful dappled shade. But I see something that looks a little bit different over here. Something not quite as green as the rest of the plants around here. So we're going to take a, a little closer look at this and see just what it is. So just what are these little bronzy, orangish, pinkish spires? So did you know that there are oh, approximately 20 different orchid species that live in the Black Hills? Uh, most of these are small and not terribly showy compared to domestic cultivars, but uh, in spite of their tiny nature, they are incredibly charming. This is a very prolific batch here, but you can see the, on a few of them anyway, the little spotted lip, a white lip with pink polka dots. held underneath a, a grouping of five petals and sepals on each flower. We'll, we'll try to get a little bit closer look at these. And so here's another little group of these. Um, they're, they're called the spotted coral root. The scientific name is Corallariza maculata. And um, as I said earlier, they uh, kind of unusual in color. They don't have any green parts. They're um, also known as non-photosynthetic saprophytes, so they're not reliant on chlorophyll and sunlight light like um, ordinary plants, we'll, we'll call them. Um, but these are actually feeding instead on a fungus that's in the ground. And so they're a little bit opportunistic in that it's only where that fungus is, when the seed finds that, um, that they'll take hold. And, and they're kind of ephemeral, so once that source of food dries up, these particular plants um, will not continue to come up. The, the seed is germless in that it, it doesn't carry any nutrition with it and and so that's somewhat of a disadvantage because it has to find that fungus pretty quickly to, to feed on but the advantage is that it makes the seed very very lightweight and indeed these seeds are so light that they're born on the jet stream and thus we find this plant the spotted coral root um, all around the northern hemisphere where conditions are, are right. So this little guy is just a little behind the others. You can see him just starting to poke out. 
the buds of the flowers still clasp, clasp tight around the stem. But soon it's going to come up and unfurl just like these. ready to get going here. Um, I might just do a quick little review of some of the bare essential materials that we'll be using. Um, remember, remember that we're using um, ink and paper. I got my Boko Undo marbling inks and my Yasutomo sketch paper or rice paper. And um, so that's how I'll be making my imagery. Um, and actually, <laughs> uh, today I'm going to be printing on some papers that I've already got made. Um, so, uh, as long as your paper is strong when it's wet and it should be quite absorbent, you'll be just fine with that. Um, even some cheap construction papers, you know, they don't have any sizing in them and they can work beautifully. Um, and then I've got my fan. I've got my, my brushes, and um, today I've got my little set of um, stacking palettes, so I've got different wells um, as separate pieces. Um, because my color scheme is going to be fairly simple, I probably really only need a couple of those, so, um, oh, maybe three. <laughs> um, and then I've got my sumifactant what I'll use to assist with the spreading of the color. Um, so let's get out some color here and and then I'll fill my vat or my tank with water. I'm using the big tank today because I've got um, big sheets of paper and I'm kind of thinking about my, my subject matter is going to have a, you know, a little bit of a reddish tinge to it. So I think the red might be a good color for me. I might mute it ever so slightly with a little black that will also um, give it a purplish tinge. If I can get the black out. Um, I've learned not to squeeze those real hard if they are clogged. So, yeah. let me get another black. <laughs> I want to save the, the drama of <laughs> my black exploding. I don't want it to blurt out all over. So I've got another uh, bottle of black here. I'm just going to put one drop in there. And, um, you know, the green is always so lovely. I, I think I'll maybe um, add a little blue to it. I'm, I'm not after a lot of light, dark contrast today, so I'm not... Um, I'm not going to use any clear or white um, to the blue. Well, it'll be dull enough. Let's let's go with that. And um, to those colors, you know, so I've got a dull red. Actually, it'll change quite a bit when I drop this on there. Oh, it won't. Maybe a little. Um, and then um, a little bit to those two. I probably am only going to need one brush. I'm not really going to... Well, I might use my fan. Uh, let's make sure I don't have any chunky monkeys or dust in here. And then we'll just add the water. Tap water today, as they say. Just water from the tap. And, oh, I shouldn't say just. Isn't our water precious? This is spring water from the Black Hills. And then I'm going to dampen my brushes. 
the brushes are just more receptive to the ink if they are damp. Um, so once I get them wet, you can see me squeezing out the water and then they're simply damp. So my, my um, designs today are going to be very, very simple. Um, I do want to make sure that I don't have any dust or um, surface tension on here. So even though I did just pour this in here and the molecules should be fairly disrupted, um, as this sits over time, they do build up a little bit of a skin. And if, if I have a skin on here, my colors will not spread out, you know, across the entire tank. So I want to make sure that I don't have any surface tension and I can ensure that by simply sweeping across. You could use torn up newspaper or this is just uh, plain newsprint. It too is quite absorbent and it will just soak up any molecules that are in a skin. I'm keeping a little paper towel just so that I can wipe my fingers off when I need to. And, and then I'm probably just going to use one brush here. I'll, I'll dip it in the red and you can see that flowing out over the whole tank. I don't care if the colors mix a little bit. Remember I am kind of after a more muted look today. And these colors are going to go right over the top of the papers that I produced earlier. So I, I marble them, then I let them dry, and then I marble them again. So that's why we call it over marbling or overdoing it. I had a young student once that called it overdoing it. Uh, and I kind of like that. So I'm just looking for some dullish blah. <laughs> Maybe just kind of some gray. <laughs> And that might be good. So let me set my brush down. I'll uh, wipe my fingers off. And then I'm going to simply, oh, which paper to go first? Let's see, I just need to choose a sheet of paper. Um, so maybe I'll do this one. Um, so there's a design on here already. Um, and also, <laughs> When I was outside, I laid down a dirty brush on it accidentally, so I do have a blotch of orange there too. Um, but who knows, that might be just what I need. So I'm going to lay that now face down because it has some ink on it already. It's, and I'm gonna ripple it, you know, move it a little bit. That gives me some kind of ripples in the design. Um, you can see that it's a, a little slow picking up the water, but it does get saturated and the ink does stick to the surface. So, so now I have my over marbled paper. You can see it's quite dark and actually quite complex with the overlapping shapes and lines. And, and I will show you these again once they're dry because they are probably a little easier to see um, then. So actually, I'm pretty happy with that. I'm going to lay it over here to dry on the newspapers I've got spread out. And I'm going to leave what I've got left over there. I'm, I'm going to just rub a couple little spots where some color sunk to the bottom. No big deal. And then I'll go on to the next paper. So I've already got some ink on there. You can see it getting pushed into the background of my new, my new picture. Notice I'm holding my brush between my first two fingers and then my other fingers just become little, little squeezers. I'm kind of milking the brush, squeezing gradually down to the tip of the bristles until I basically emptied it. 
Oh my, the green is quite bright, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> um, so a good way to dull green is with red. It'll just kind of take the edge off of it. Can you hear that pitter-patter of rain? I, I think it's kind of, in a way, um, fitting that we have a little water <laughs> dripping on the roof of the studio. <laughs> um, so there, I've got my color down. Um, now I, I can blow on this or move it around with the fan. Um, let's just do that a little bit on this one. You might even hear the horses down in the barn. I, um, it rained kind of hard there for a little bit, so I, um, I brought them in. I was afraid it might hail. Um, and then I'm going to take another sheet of paper here. Oh, let's... This one's kind of tending towards um, greens and blues already. Um, you can see when I put the first layer on, I rippled it this way. Um, so, you know, that would have happened doing kind of this sort of motion. So maybe on this one I'll, I'll do the opposite. Get that kind of loosened up there. So I'm going to start in the corner and as it goes down I'm going to gently rock it and I can go in slow rocking or more rapid. Kind of get some variation in there. Actually these papers can be kind of cool just um, just the way they are too without drawing on them. So again, a, a quite dark paper, but that's just the underpinnings of my drawing. I have a couple more to do, I think two to be exact. Um, I do believe I may want a little more red ink. I'm going to leave that, that stuff on there that's there already. And maybe I should try not putting quite as much ink as I have been. Um, maybe a little lighter could be desirable. <clears throat> so We'll just go with this. Um, I've got a paper here with some grays, violets, reds, blues, yellow, and it's got kind of a slow big ripple on it. So let's lay it down. I'm going to do another slow ripple on it that will kind of randomly crisscross the lines already on the paper. Now, you wouldn't have to move it, you can just lay it down flat too, but I guess I'm feeling fancy today. And once it's saturated, the, the ink is on there and I could just pull it right up. Whew, nice. Pretty. And we'll lay that one out to dry. And I think I'll, I'll try that again with just a um, light application of color. Once in a while, I'm worried that my camera is not running, so I had to check. Ooh, that's bright. Try to muddy it up a little bit.
I'm just I'm kind of thinking of the the plants out there that we saw and just the ecosystem that they're in it's so deeply complex there's so many layers of of patterns in there and so that's part of the inspiration behind putting these layers of color down in the over marbled paper swirl in there. Here it is before. And well, maybe I'll just lay this one down flat. I won't wiggle it. You can see with the ink already on there it takes it just a little time to soak up the color in the water and then it's ready to come off. So there we have it, the, the simple process of over marbling. I'm going to let those dry and then, um, then we'll look at what we can do with, <clears throat> with some drawing materials to make a picture on top of that over marbled paper. And while I've, while I've got the tank out, I think I'll just... Uh, do a few more kind of regular sheets. Oh, I know why there's no ink coming out. It's because it's empty. How about that? Okay. Good to know. Well, here I'll, I'll make some clear. I just like to have a, a dark light contrast, so um, some clear would be good. Um, I've got black, red. How about black, red, and yellow? There's a there's a striking color combination. Well, my yellow might be a little a little greenish. Then we add our surfactant. Again, if you were wondering, the, the surfactant is uh, from a plant and it just helps the color float. And in this well, I put um, a bunch of surfactant in there with just the water and that will serve as a clear on my marbled papers. So this time I'm going to skim. I do have some ink on here and it, it did sit here for a little bit so I'm going to remove it. You can see I've chased it way down here to the end and then if I lay that dry part of my newspaper strip on top of it, it will get absorbed and removed. So I'm going to use one uh, brush for light, one for dark, and I'll just go back to more of the traditional way of applying the color. And it basically comes down to alternating. Um, with my dark and light colors for contrast, it gives the whole thing a little bit of pep. If I want to mix colors, I can do that. As I've said before, the, the colors, the way they come out of the bottle, they're a little bit crass and, and so um, a little bit of mixing can take the edge off, make it a little more 
pleasing, at least to my eye. <laughs> kind of like the soft colors. I can control the width of the band by how long and how much I squeeze out of it. Once my surface is fairly saturated, I'll use a little wind made from my fan, maybe blow on it a little with my breath. so that I lay it down nice and smooth. And there we are. Just leave that on there as long as I continue on relatively soon then um, what's on there shouldn't be a problem it'll just become a little more of a mixed up area in the background of my new design I always find there's um, just a wonderful rhythm just to the process itself. The process itself is like a mantra of motion.
and so now the papers are dry and um, so you know the color is going to look a little bit different on them now that they're dry but but take a look at that you should be able to see that there's overlapping patterns overlapping areas of color and generally speaking a rather even tonality or um, evenness to the light and dark in these papers um, and I will show you a um, uh, the same sheets in black and white so that you can um, see the tonality without the color but um, let's just kind of file through these and I think there's just four of them here one one easy way to see tonality or value as we call it sometimes is to kind of squint at the paper and and you kind of want to at this point uh, see nothing that's super dark and nothing that's super light and there may be some things that stand out a little bit but it should have generally a low key look to it in terms of lights and darks you know so this paper does have these lightish veins running through here and um, so as we move into the usage of this paper now as a substrate for a drawing, um, I'll show you how I'm going to address a paper like this that has some lighter areas in it. So that's the overmarbling, and now we're going to move forward with turning one of these into a drawing. And so um, I think I will use this paper. I've also taken a, a couple of photos. Um, this is that spotted coral root and I'm going to use this photo to create a drawing on my overmarbled paper. And I, I kind of like the, the way the paper has some of these kind of mm, deep, dullish, reddish purple um, colors in it, or hues. Um, so I see some correlation in the color structure and um, even some of these goldy, orangey, brown colors. Um, uh, you can see that the photograph has much more light dark contrast than the paper and so um, while, while I will first be kind of trying to even out the tonality in the paper here by darkening some of these light areas um, and maybe even lightening a dark area like that although maybe not um, Ultimately, I'm going to be building in the lights and darks in the order that I see in this photograph. And to help you see that a little bit more clearly, I've, I've also um, made a black and white photograph of that same image. Um, so, you know, at least the very lightest shapes show up a little better, as do some of the darkest shapes. So let's review some of the, uh, or take a look rather, at some of the materials that we have to use in our drawing. And then we'll get busy working, working up this image. So to begin with, I've, I've laid out a few of the materials I think I might need. This is going to be a mixed media drawing. I've got both wet and dry mediums here. So um, 
I like to have available right at hand any kind of drawing tool that I think I might just want to grab because I like to keep it a little spontaneous and just um, have um, some light things so um, mainly that's my my gesso which is a it's an acrylic gesso it's usually used as a undercoat for a painting um, I like the finish that it has um, for drawing on so I'll use some gesso, uh, perhaps watered down a little bit, depending on how light I want to go. I've got a variety of brushes ready here to go. Um, I can use my eyedropper and this bottle to get the right mixture in my little palette here. Um, also in terms of light media, I've got uh, a white colored pencil and this is a Prismacolor brand colored pencil so it uh, really imparts a lot of color. I can um, make something dark light pretty easily with this. Uh, and then I've also got some some white charcoal. Um, so those are my white things, my light things, and then I've got my dark things. So. Uh, another Prismacolor colored pencil, this one black, and then a couple of different drawing pencils, just kind of what I happen to have laying around. This is a HB, this is a 2B, the 2B being slightly softer and darker than the HB. Um, of course, in comparison to the black colored pencil, these will look a little bit more like gray or silverish. Um, and then I've got a black ballpoint pen. Um, I kind of like the thin, crisp line I can get from that. And um, just a regular number two pencil. Um, I have this one mainly because of the eraser on it. Um, and it's kind of a little bit dried out. You know, it's one of those pencils that's kind of laid around here for a long time. The eraser gets a little dried out, but I find that really nice for kind of blending and smudging things. So I've um, got that pencil. Actually I, I think maybe I'll add in, um, I've got a 6B here also. A 6B would be a very soft um, drawing pencil. I've got a smudge stick in case I need it, an eraser. And then I also have, um, and at this point I'm not quite sure if I'll use them or you know, at least maybe just a touch, but I've got some colors. Uh, these again are the, the Prismacolor brand colored pencil. And um, those um, just really have a lot of pigment in them, so they're pretty useful if you want a little zap of color in there. And I've, I've just selected a, a variety of um, browns, gold, pale yellow, and pinky reds that to me kind of fit the um, color scheme of my my subject. Um, and then of course uh, occasionally we need to sharpen a pencil, so I've got a pencil sharpener. Um, sometimes these um, softer leaded pencils, the, the um, colored pencils, or even a, a soft leaded drawing pencil and certainly the charcoal they break pretty easily and so instead of the pencil sharpener sometimes a little lightweight utility knife will come in handy for keeping those sharp. So those are the materials we'll be using and um, I think we're ready to to get some of our preliminary drawing done. So one of the, the really cool things about being an artist is that you can take a, 
the image like the one I've got here, which um, I realize you know, from what you're seeing of it now may look a little bit confusing. And so um, what I can do in my drawing is make it more, more clear, less confusing. Um, I can even show things that I may know about this subject that don't show in the photograph. So um, I'm just going to begin with my... Um, Oh, I think I'll use my white colored pencil. Um, alternately, I could use my, my white charcoal. And, oh, maybe I'll use the white charcoal. <laughs> I talked myself into it. Um, and I'm going to simply do an outline of the objects that I see in the drawing. And um, I guess the reason I'm... I'm thinking the charcoal might be better is it will be easier to erase if I want to. Um, but of course the other thing about this is that um, if, if I don't make my drawing exactly like the photograph, that's going to be okay. Um, you know, I may want to have an alternate arrangement of things. Uh, emphasize some things more. Um, so I'm just going to start to kind of feel my way around this drawing. Um, often I like to start by finding the middle of both my photograph and of my drawing paper and, and just see what is there. And then um, start drawing things in. Now at some point I will be also using my wet media, that's my, my gesso, and um, I try to kind of plan that um, for just before I want to take a break, and that way, um, that way it can dry. <laughs> um, the paper is um, certainly not conducive to drawing on when it's wet, so, um, so I'll kind of be going back and forth between light and dark and painting and drawing, and so I need to kind of keep in mind when the right time for um, something wet is, and when the right time for my dry things. Yes. And I'm focusing on the object. Um, it's this stalk of orchid flowers, the spotted coral root. Um, in my picture, there's a lot of kind of fuzzy jazz in the background. Um, in my drawing, I'm going to I'm going to leave that all out. I'm going to probably go for more kind of a dark background and and emphasize the lightness, the comparative lightness of the the flower stalk. Um, so some of what I see here, I'm not going to not going to put it in.
And if, if you're looking at this thinking, you know, wow, that's really confusing. Yes, it is. And um, so actually one reason I'm not talking a lot is because I'm, I'm focused on the lines and shapes and how they all fit together. And I, you know, I'm doing the drawing. Consider the consider you know the execution of the drawing as um, the work of deconfusing this. And so once I get these outlines in, then I'm going to start to work with light and dark. So that's, those are the outlines. just going into my background and starting to do um, some hatch lines just kind of darkening that a little more I'm going to use um, kind of the same tools that I did uh, initially, um, colored pencil, that is the black one, and my regular drawing pencil. I don't necessarily want to have my marbling in the background completely disappear, but I need to subdue it. I need to just knock it back a little bit. Um, dark dark tends to recede in space and light tends to advance so I want this just to become more dull and more dark and I think in this little square here you can already see the shape of the flower at least along this edge popping out a little bit not, not a whole lot but a little bit and the background beginning to drop behind. Usually I use a paper towel for this, but in order that my hand isn't constantly 
smearing my drawing, um, it is sometimes good to have something to set your hand on. <laughs> um, just to protect the drawing a little bit. And I think I'll go back to that same sequence of putting on the drawing pencil first. And then my uh, black colored pencil. And I can always darken it more later, so, um, and probably will. Um, so there's no, um, no need to get too aggressive with it right away. I want to bring the whole drawing, both the darks and the lights, and the um, negative shapes, and the subject. I want to bring them along kind of evenly, so... Um, you know, just because I've kind of gone to over this corner once and the negative shapes doesn't mean, well, you know, negative shapes mean in the background, that doesn't mean that I'm done visiting that area. Um, because I may eventually, as the drawing progresses, I may decide later that I need more. So I approach it as kind of an additive process that I'm um, adding until satisfied. Um, and of course I always do have my eraser handy if I need it. Some of this I might feel like it's kind of dull enough the way it is. You know, maybe I don't need a whole lot in here. You know, just hit a few places. I see a few parts where the, the blue is kind of bright there. Just kind of dull that down a little bit. kind of a random approach as to which direction I'm making these hatch lines or hatch marks. I may, you know, kind of play with um, more crisp lines juxtaposed with more kind of smooth areas of tone. And 
going to take some time, but um, I think you can see on this half of the drawing the object starting to, to show up a little bit there. Sometimes I kind of lose my way. Got to kind of regroup and look again. How does that go? Another way to keep my pencil point sharper is to keep turning my pencil in my hand so that I'm constantly wearing it down into more of a point. And every now and again, um, if I squint, kind of look through my eyelashes, that does help me see if, if the image is um, beginning to emerge from, from the murk. So um, I can especially see that where I've worked, so I, I feel like I'm, I'm making the progress that I want. these um, softer leaded pencils, um, they do run down um, pretty quickly. So you see me sharpening fairly often.
So I've got my um, first layer of dark in there, and um, I am going to take a little bit of a break soon, so I feel like this is a good time to use some of my wet media. And, um, and then that'll give it a chance to dry before I come back into this. So, so I'm going to mix up a little bit of, of my gesso, um, watered down just a little bit. And I'm going to be looking to apply that mainly to the, the whitest parts that I have in my drawing. Okay, so these, the lips of the flowers, the, the spotted coral lip, spotted coral root lip, um, obviously the whitest part, um, but I've also got some lightish parts or parts where if I make it white to begin with, my yellow is going to show up a little better. Um, also these areas to the sides on the petals and sepals. Um, and I may even lighten up some of this where the, the light's shining on the top of this unopened bud. So basically looking for what's light and very light and, and getting the underpinnings of, of light in there. So in my little palette here, I'll just... Um, Get a little bit of gesso. It's it's fairly thick, so you know full strength I feel would be too opaque. Um, I have this scrap of of the same background paper um, because I'd cut this into a square, so I have a little left over here, and and this would be a good place for me to test that. You see, if I put it on straight. It's going to be fairly opaque. And I don't really want that. I feel like that's too heavy. So if I add some water, I'll have a little lighter mixture. I can always add more later, but it's, it's going to be hard to subtract that. You know, so I'm I'm a little happier with with this sort of effect, where my um, patterned paper or my color from the marbling is going to still show through a bit. So I'll just like I said, I'm going to start with the whitest things first. And this paper, it it is very absorbent and that was really key for, for the marbling part. Um, but it also makes it so that it holds quite a bit of water. And um, thus I, I will need um, the drying time. Just kind of beginning to build in my light values.
once again every so often. Um, squinting at it is going to help me see if I'm achieving what I'm after. And I see I, I actually had um, covered up something here, um, but it's not too late, it was dark, now it's light.
So I want to make sure that that is all good and dry before I try drawing on it again. So um, this is going to um, take a little break here and I'll come back to it when it's dry. So I've, I've roughed in my, my light and dark shapes. And I think the, oops, the imagery is starting to, to show up now, so it's a little drying time here. Well, it's had a chance to dry now, and um, so we're ready to proceed with, with adding in more lights, more darks, more details. Um, I did happen to, um, was it this one? I came across a gold-colored pencil, and I was just experimenting a little bit with that in the background, thinking that might be kind of a fun thing um, to do back in, well, maybe even just some parts of the background. Um, but I think I'll begin today with um, with just doing a little ballpoint pen work, more kind of in a uh, um, just as a, a real fine tool so that I can get some um, kind of thin, detailed lines, some that are kind of scribbly and passionate and um, just kind of sharpen up the imagery a little bit, maybe outline a few things, do a little shading with it, kind of define some of these um, more detailed aspects of the image. Uh, I might also, I think I could kind of start to mark in where some of those spots are going to go. So maybe, you know, just in that one part, you can kind of see the, the effects of that. And I think I did say earlier that um, that sometimes um, I'm looking for my charcoal. Um, sometimes we can explain 
things even better than a photograph. Um, I happen to know that the the white lip of this orchid has these two little um, appendages up at the near the top of it, of the lip, and I can see it on this side. On this side, it's a little vague, um, but in my drawing, I might just. I'm using my white colored pencil now. Um, I might just show it a little more clearly on both sides, even though it's not appearing that way in the photograph. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, part of the just kind of roaming around the drawing with my ballpoint pen now, I'm also, you know, roaming around the image with my eyes as well. So this is a chance for me to catch things that maybe I missed the first time around. And again, I see I'm kind of sparing, <clears throat> inadvertently smearing my own drawing, so let's, let's get another sheet of paper. That'll just keep that from happening. Let's see, I've got <laughs> graphite on my hands now. And then the next thing I'm going to want to do is um, I want to start putting in some of the colors. And, and mainly that is just the, um, the reddish violet that's in there and um, some of the yellows in tan. So a little bit of yellow and parts of the bl the bloom and then uh, yellow and tan in the, um, in the stock. So let's I'll just get these last couple outlines in. Just a little scribbling around. <laughs> Gotta 
this group. And since I'm able to talk while I draw, um, I just have to say that, you know, there's a reason we went out in the woods first. I, I think that probably it's pretty easy to see where I get my inspiration. And then as I draw and I see these beautiful forms, um, I, I guess I feel a, a close connection with this plant as I draw. So it's got some meaning to me. Um, um, I think it was C.S. Lewis that said once, if you really want to know what something looks like, draw it. So, let's see, that, that looks like about it. Um, you know, and that, that's just kind of some minor additions to that, but um, let's go ahead and just zap in some of the violet. Um, so, I think this color, well, they're calling it raspberry, but I think it's going to be pretty good. So, I'm going to look for the areas where I see just a touch of that reddish, violetish color and go ahead and put that in. Still keeping my approach pretty loose, pretty sketchy. See, in terms of value, this is a pretty dark color. And I have a suspicion that a little later I'm going to want to add in some black with it in places. You'll see here where it's really very dark and um, I think a combination of this color and the black is going to be best. Um, I might even, I could test that out, I might even <laughs> test this out too. Just to give it a little zing, I might even add in a little pink. These um, Prismacolor water, or not watercolors, these Prismacolor colored pencils do blend really well with each other. So I can pile in um, several colors together. So just to kind of test that out, let's Go in here with the black. I'll just kind of do a little trial run with this flower here. I've got the, um, well, a yellow. I'm not sure if it's going to be yellow enough. And I'm also going to use my white 
colored pencil. I, you know, I put a layer of gesso on there, the, that white paint. Um, and it's not that I want to use the colored pencil for the entire lip, but um, just enough to brighten up and bring forward. Remember, light colors, and especially white, are going to pop forward. Um, so I might even put some in here, just a tad. like that. Yeah, and then I, th I think I will go ahead and I, I like the idea of the gold with that deep red-violet. So this is just another set of hatching over the layers that I already have. Uh, it's also going to have the also going to lighten it a little bit because it is darker or lighter than the um, pencil and black colored pencil that are on there and um, that's all right because I think my flower shape is going to stand out just fine. And I, I believe you could still see the the deep, deep color that's behind all of that, um, that is the marbling. Um, so let's, well, let's, let's carry on with the, the reds. Because I did kind of get, uh, off of those just because I wanted to see how the the total sequence would go and how it would all play out. Always aware of the amount of pressure I'm putting on the pencil. I um, want to maintain kind of a sensitivity to that. That um, helps, believe it or not, helps to lend a certain amount of energy um, to the finished piece. I'm a big believer in the power of mark making.
throw in just a little dash of this, um, well, they call it process red, kind of so hot pink. I just want to liven up the color a little bit. Just blending it in with the darker dollar red. That's going to be um, part of the background.
you've probably noticed, I have a um, number of materials that I haven't even touched and um, probably won't, but I, as I said earlier, I do like to have a lot of different um, drawing tools sitting here ready to go should I decide that I want them. my black colored pencil a little more. I just sharpened it wanting to have some nice crisp lines. And it's not, not a heavy outline everywhere. It's got to be sensitive. It's got to vary. Uh, sometimes it may even be absent. This will help bring out those shapes. So, you know, it should be fun, shouldn't have to fuss too much. Like I said, I picked a rather complex subject, but um, if you start with something that um, for you isn't presenting much of a challenge, that's going to be the best way to go to begin with, and um, you should enjoy it. Just kind of, don't be afraid, it's just a piece of paper. And um, there's always lots of that around, so um, keep it loose, keep your energy going in there. That looks blue. <laughs> I think where it's with the yellow. Well, that's kind of cool. So we might have things, um, see it here too. Uh, mixture of my colors is giving a bright turquoise in places unexpected um, but I am going to embrace that and love having it as part of this drawing I suppose if I want I could even add you know, get out a turquoise pencil and really go for it
This little petal here is kind of, it almost merges with this one. Um, but the orchid always has a lip one, and then um, some of these are petals and some are sepals, and there's five of them. So one, two, three, four, five. So I had to kind of stop and count there for a second. This uh, little one down here in the corner, I'm going to let it be a little um, subdued. So I'm not going to whiten up the lip on that one quite like I have on these other two. Um, so now, uh, I, think, I think the last thing I want to do with this is work over the background with my gold. You know, I realize I have not done a whole, uh, a whole lot with this area here, but that's mainly because I'm pretty satisfied with the way it looks. So, you know, there's really more marbling showing through there. Um, than anywhere else. Um, but let's, let's just play around with this gold a little more.
and I don't need to have the same application of this gold everywhere. Like I'm kind of liking this um, clayish gray blue here. Um, so rather than losing that, I'm going to retain it. Just um, keep a little bit of that showing through. So my gold, I'm just going to kind of lighten up on it a little here. I'm just kind of looking to see if there's any anything else. Like, like this is a little too flat. Just gonna get something in there. There you have it. Um, so now, there we have it. We've transformed this over-marbled sheet of paper into a drawing. So the marbling is just buried down in there. And um, we get this really active, pleasing drawing. So I hope that um, you get a chance to try out some of these techniques. I've certainly enjoyed showing them to you and uh, look forward to being with you again, if not in person, um, virtually. Again, I'm Mary Whip, your virtual visiting artist with the Sanford Arts program. Thanks for joining me. Bye-bye.